And we are live. So everyone, thank you for joining me on this live stream. This is the second episode of Crypto Talks brought to you by Genius X. And we're here to talk with some awesome leaders in the crypto space. Uh, Genius X offers projects an accelerated program with a mentoring pitch presentation advice, marketing and legal support and much, much more. And this is all a part of that advisory program and where uh, where project founders can get questions and advice and experience in, uh, from these various uh, experts in the Web3 space. Now, in this episode, we have two special guests joining us. We have uh, here uh, Vex Vukman, CEO of Revuto, and Patrick Tobler, CEO of Enmaker, joining us, as well as uh, Jason Gao, Program Manager and Investor Relations at Genius X. So welcome, everyone, to the podcast. Here. Thank you. Now, I think I'll start off first a little bit uh, with an introductory about um, Genius X and the advisory program. So, Jason, could you give us a little bit of an overview of the advisory program in general? Sure. Thanks, Pete. So, basically, the uh, Genius X advisory program is a value adding network uh, that we build at Genius X together with a group of advisors. Uh, which typically include um, reputable and experienced founders in the Web3 space, like Vex and Patrick that we have today, uh, or investors in the crypto space and other influencing key opinion leaders. Um, so basically, they will act, they will join our advisory program and act as mentors to uh, advise um, um, within our startup ecosystem. So basically, startups in our accelerator program or other startups that work with Genius X in other form and by sharing their uh, experience, their expertise, uh, and most importantly, their potential network to help them to, uh, to build success for their business and or solve problems uh, they have uh, on the way of building their business. So uh, it's really a kind of, um, um, I think it's a, it's a network uh, with value uh, that we hope will benefit startups that are in our program. Which is absolutely awesome, yeah. and especially to learn from people that have gone through the entire, entire process of starting their own business, uh, going through startup phases, raising funds and whatnot is really, really cool. And I'm sure that these guys have uh, made mistakes along the way, and it's always really good to learn from your mistakes and having them uh, being shared on an episode like this is I think really key. But uh, for those that don't know our guests, uh, could we get a little bit of an introduction from you guys in regards to who you are, uh, a little bit about your background and uh, what you've built in the past perhaps, and uh, how you're all going now with your particular projects. And I think we'll start with Vex first. So Vex, uh, let's get a little intro. Okay. So yeah, my name is Vex. Uh, I'm C. I've been in a crypto space since 2017. That was when I actually uh, went to San Francisco uh, searching for a funding for my ex startup. And then I met uh, my CTO there who was at the time working for Intuit, the biggest fintech company in the world. And we started to talk about um, the crypto space, the financial industry and when it, it is all going to. Um, I, I would say I found myself at the right right place in the right time because uh, I came there in January 2017 when that last, I would say, uh, uh, crypto craze happened and uh, it, it helped me personally and financially and then I started to uh, 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 learn about the crypto space, about the blockchain technology and everything and um, I have my own reasons why I... Uh, um, Founded the Re Revuto, so I actually wanted always to build something that would help people uh, in certain way to solve some problems. At the time, I have my problems with the subscription, with the subscription that I was paying for. I was paying a lot of those things to run my business. I was losing track to whom, how much, with what, and when I was paying for. And I saw the opportunity to build something to help people in that situation, but also it was an opportunity to also somehow combine the Web3 technology with that fintech part of the product, because I think that the blockchain offers so many cool things and features where people can benefit from, save money, earn some money as well, 
and this is also something that could actually what we are building invite people to world of crypto so we are a bit, bit different we are not building specifically uh, heavy hardcore blockchain stuff for crypto savvy people no we are building it for everybody and then we uh, uh, um, show them or we provide them some cool web3 features which are more like uh, through web2 interface and user ex experience which should be easy for everybody and you know that is what we do um so yeah ho hopefully our mistakes are not gonna uh, you know, cost us a lot <laughs> and we're gonna deliver what we promised <laughs> beautiful awesome and uh, yourself patrick yeah, um, thank you so much for for having me. I I really like what what Vex said about uh, you know building for the for the world outside instead of just for the for the crypto bubble in a way and onboarding people by solving actual problems with uh, web free technology, and and that's really what we at Endmaker try to do as well. So we we build infrastructure for businesses that want to solve actual problems with web free technology. So everything that we do from you know nft minting to also secondary markets and uh, apis and so on on everything that we do is tailored towards businesses that really want to go outside and say okay i want to for example sell nfts and i don't want people to know that they are buying nfts i just want them to to experience the technology and not really have to care about you know what blockchain or what tech is behind the scenes um, so we really, really focused on just putting that into the background and, and onboarding businesses, onboarding artists, onboarding, uh, you know, celebrities, etc., into the space and, um, yeah, and deliver value for them through NFTs and through, through blockchain. And, um, yeah, Vex talked so long, so maybe I can, I can try a few <laughs> more uh, seconds, but, <laughs> um, you know, we, so we we started as Thank the you, very first, <laughs> we started as the very first NFT minting tool in Cardano back in the day. So that was the very first time that people were actually able to do something with uh, the ADA instead of just sending it from A to B or staking it. And um, yeah, and since then, you know, we're responsible for uh, twenty percent of all NFTs on the chain, and we've uh, I think made quite an impact. And I'm very happy about you know enabling so many people to actually just launch their own stuff and do whatever they want to do to really, um, you know, use, use web free. Yes. It's a, an amazing background story. And, um, I, I'm, I'm sure, uh, both of you have learned, uh, along the way, um, many lessons and this is what we want to talk about the mistakes to avoid hopefully. when launching your startup yeah hopefully you've, you've learned something <laughs> along the way and you don't repeat those mistakes again but yeah let's get some of these uh startup experiences that you have so ha have you guys got any highlights in regards to mistakes that you've done in launching your companies i know vex you've got a couple of uh, companies uh, that you've um, yeah. gone through in the past uh, you got anything to share? Uh, some a highlight mistake that you've had in the past uh, through running one of your highlight companies? Highlight mistakes. Uh, well, yeah. Always, I I think that the team is the most most crucial thing when you're building your startup. Uh, it's really important who do you pick for your co-founders because there should be really the same level of the energy and everything, and uh, um, uh, you know, you you need to be. Uh, it's going to be stressful, you know, so you know, you really have to be resistant to all that and uh, you have to be uh, aware that you're not going to sleep much and it's going to be hard uh, in startup business and I would say in every business is hard to succeed. Uh, in Cardano, there are so many great projects, but unfortunately, we're not all going to succeed and that's, that's, that's a harsh truth. And you have to accept it and it's really hard and especially if you do well at some point and then at some point it's really hard and you are you know you don't know if you're gonna survive or not or if you have a good product product market fit or, or if it's the right timing or you know so many things so yeah and then you try to learn on your mistakes but sometimes i even amaze myself because uh, i always you know think that uh, i am experienced and then i find myself in situation or the similar situation that and, and then i make the i wouldn't say the same mis mistake but yeah mistakes are part of the process so yeah and what about yourself patrick yeah um i mean you know i i never intended 
to start a business or start a company when I started and maker and maker started off as like a one week side project during my bachelor thesis. And then it just uh, blew up overnight basically. And, and I said, okay, let's keep at it and let's build something around it. Mm, and so, and it's also my first company, so I don't have the experience of effects. So I made like more mistakes in those two years than I ever did in my whole life. Like, all combined i think it's it's crazy <laughs> and and someone said um someone once said that you know founding a company and running it is is like biting on glass all the time every day and <laughs> and it really I, i'm telling you it's the uh, it's it's really difficult and um and there are so many things you know that that i could talk about which which are difficult to to man maneuver you know just from like, where do you actually found a company? Do you found it in, like, I'm from Germany. Do you found it in Germany? Do you found it in, in Switzerland? How we eventually ended up doing it? Do you do it in Dubai? You know, where's the best legislation for crypto? How do you do taxes? Um, of course, the team is super important. Like, hiring people is really, really difficult. Um, I think, like, hiring the right people that really fit and, and provide value to you. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes there you know, wasted hundreds of thousands of dollars basically there. And um, and and then also acting in, in a space like crypto where basically the market is so volatile, uh, you, you have to, you can't just build a business normally. You, ha you have to really rely on the trends a little bit and, and go with the flow and see, okay, where is it going? Uh, what can you do right now? Um, when do you cash out your crypto? Stuff like that. I think a lot of projects in the space can tell you about how they had like a lot of money in ADA and then ADA price went from $2.50 to 30 cents and suddenly they don't have any money anymore. So, so there are a lot of things that, that went wrong. Um, but there were also a lot of things that went right, you know, and, and a lot of luck that we had and a lot of um, like good decisions that we made. But in, in general, it's yeah, a, a, a lot of uh, learning definitely that, that happened over over the course of these like last two years. Now you both uh, talked about um, hiring people and uh, making sure that you have the right team around you. Uh, some of the times, like uh, myself, when, when I hire people, I, I I get it wrong, and there must be some secret formula to get and find the right people to join your team. Do you guys have any tips around hiring? in general and um i think the hardest part is also letting someone go uh from your company uh, you know they've been loyal they've worked really uh, well kind of really well but you know there's problems like how do you let people go as well you know it's really it's really strange if you start hiring people before having your first real job uh, like I did, <laughs> so <laughs> that um, is, yeah, a good point. <laughs> so, so that that's a really strange thing. I, I mean, I, I had like internships and stuff like that, but never a real full time job um, because I went right from university. But it's, uh, it, I I would say the thing that I would do differently is I would hire a lot slower than I did. Like when we started and we had a lot of lot of success, you know, I was like, okay, let's hire, you know, people for this and that and a full marketing team and so on. And I would say, okay, let's focus on just picking very few people, making sure they are 100% um, a fit for the role, that they're really invested into the product that you're building, that they're really committed and that they're a great fit for the team. And then just going like one by one and making the team better that way and not try to just hire like, uh, you know, in all different directions. So really to f just focus. Patrick, you know, uh, hearing myself really, you know, it's like a copy and paste. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the biggest problem. And I would add also, you know, we were hiring also very fast because we could, and we thought that we, you know, uh, should, and then we did it. And also I didn't spend much time on uh, uh, scouting those people. So I always hired the people who were close to my network, maybe my friends and everything. And that was wrong. I didn't hire professionals or people who had experience in building things like we are. So that was the biggest mistake. And then, yes, we were trying to do too much at the same time. And we thought that we need, you know, uh, I don't know, 
first example is, for instance, you know, the Telegram and Discord and everything. So we open international channels like we are Real Madrid, you know, we have to have, you know, different admins in different languages, you know, who cares in the end. But that I remember that only for that we were paying like $16,000 per month only to manage those international admins. And we were covering those channels 24-7, even the night shifts. Why? You know, we could easily say, you know, uh, you know, we work from 10 to a.m. to 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. and that was it. Uh, but that that's just one example. Uh, but as Patrick said, you know, spent a lot of money on unnecessary things. And also we lost, I would say, focus as well. Um, maybe even too much engaged with the discussion with the, with the community about the things that we should do. So we also lost focus because they are mainly focused on token price and everything and how token performance and you know we should be more focused on delivering the product so and also i did some mistakes you know because uh, uh, you know i wanted to prove everybody from the community that we are also capable of building DeFi things and everything so at one point you know i wanted to do even to build a dex on the mobile device so we spent a lot of money uh, building that thing and then you know uh, uh, crypto market went down we couldn't find you know it was actually impossible for us to launch that thing and you know when i look now um back you know why why we did that that wasn't even our you know core feature on or, or anything so so yeah <laughs> crazy <laughs> I do uh, that kind of stuff happens that. so quickly like when you yeah. have success and you and you get all these opportunities and everyone is excited for all these different things and coming to you and wants to do something. And you you really have to pick like, what do you do and not get caught up? And that's very difficult, uh, really difficult. I think everyone gets um, caught up in that. You know, if, so if someone comes to you and pitches you a great project, you want to do it. You want to partner with them. You want to build something great with them. You think, okay, we can do it. But even if it's just like 5% of your attention, that goes towards that and then you have another few things then suddenly you're spending like 50 percent of your time not on the core product and on the core like mission of your company and that's that's a big problem i feel like and um and that, that happened to us as well of course uh, i i think that happens to a lot of people unfortunately yeah yeah that's true now Patrick, you mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, setting up your company and uh, now you're set up in Switzerland. Is that correct? Yep. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, how do you get that? Uh, not, not necessarily how do you get that set up, but how do you decide where to set up a company? Because I've heard from many other crypto projects that you know they've set up in Australia and they regret doing it because of all the tax laws and, and everything around it. Uh, and costing them so much and if they just set up in another country it would have saved them uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars so in terms of setting up your companies do you have any advice for anyone um, on where might be the best places in the world to set up um, a company especially in the crypto space i mean so so the way we we handled that was we wanted to set it up in germany first um and then we quickly realized, okay, you can't really do anything with crypto in Germany. Um, there are barely any crypto startups there. And it's clear why, because the regulations are so difficult to maneuver. You like it's not it's not that it's impossible to do, but you just don't know what you're allowed to do, you know. And if I'm not if I don't know if I'm allowed to, you know, sell NFTs, for example. And I'm always like scared, okay, am I going to go to jail because I'm selling NFTs? Because there are simply no clear rules for that. That's very <laughs> frustrating and very scary. So, so it was very clear, like, we can't do it in Germany. Um, and then, you know, the, there are a few options out there. There's basically the option to, to go to one of the, like, uh, offshore islands, like a lot of the companies are doing, the Seychelles, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and then, you know, you can go to Dubai, I guess, and Singapore. Um, and then f as a European, uh, like, probably the most legit choice to go to is switzerland because it's a very it's a very serious uh, country it's a very you know well standing con country and it's also very close you know i was born at the border uh, like half a kilometer away from switzerland they speak the same language so it's a, like an obvious choice for for someone from germany um 
but the the drawback is that it's very expensive and uh, finding even a bank account for a company is extremely difficult you know we we are at like one of the private banks here we pay absurd amount amounts of money just for the bank account and uh, basically the reason is that no one uh, no other bank is is taking crypto companies so like every single large crypto company in switzerland is with that one bank and they host like private dinners and stuff and you go there and you meet like the founder of random blockchains and stuff like that it's really cool but it's also <laughs> very expensive so um so stuff like this is really the difficult part that no one really tells you about beforehand and i don't know if i would do switzerland again i feel like it might be easier to just really say okay let's do like an offshore thing um set it up there like all the other other crypto companies out there as well like yeah. but i i would love to hear what what vex has to say yeah. about that too yeah. because he has a lot more experience in, in setting up companies than i do <laughs> yeah so basically uh i already knew that we're gonna do it in croatia why is that so because i knew that in europe there was only option to do it in Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Slovenia, or Croatia. Those four countries were crypto friendly. Estonia was crypto friendly, but at some point they more switched to fintech and Latvia as well, and they're not so so crypto friendly anymore. Um, also, you mentioned that it's close to where you were born and everything, so it's easier because you need to talk to regulators, you need to open the bank account. So if you do it in some uh, uh, other country, those things are more complicated. Uh, Switzerland was an option for us, but I also did some due diligence uh, uh, and uh, I learned that it's, although it's a crypto friendly, it's very regulated and very expensive uh, to run a crypto company there. So in the end, you know, this was the best option and um, Croatia is also, uh, there is an advantage because we are lagging, you know, behind uh, Western uh, countries and everything. So, and people are not so here into those um, new things. So, uh, you know, I was really uh, uh, one of the few who were involved in crypto and everything in Switzerland. People talk about it. You know, you even have that uh, crypto valley there. Uh, so, you have many crypt uh, crypto companies. So, in Croatia, maybe altogether from 2017, I think maybe five to ten companies altogether which are crypto companies i would say uh and maybe two to three alive so it's a quite you know and nobody <laughs> i wouldn't say care about us but you know we are not uh you know big thing here so we can go under the radar uh you know so it was a smart decision in the end for us to be here uh, and also, you mentioned offshore. That was not an option for us because we have also that fintech part of the company. We are we need to be regulated. We have some other things that we uh, need to cover. So if you are offshore, we, you're not then part of the European Union. And then if you need to sign deals with all those service providers like Fiat to Crypto, on ramp, on ramp, it's hard to do that if you're an offshore company. But if you're if you're, and it's also you're more fight, hard to. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, that's it. Yeah. yeah, it's also more hard to raise money, capital, stuff like that. Like oh, it's yeah. just not not so legit. So I'm I'm fully with you, and that was part of the reason as well why we took Switzerland instead of like going to a random country. But it seems to work for a lot of companies. You know, FTX billion dollar company. I know not good stuff happened to them, but they were <laughs> able to at least run their op operations there. So, yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> So in yeah, regards to uh, maybe we're gonna one day all end up somewhere offshore. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Who knows? In in regards to raising funds, like uh, and yeah. and starting your companies up, like th there is a question here from the audience. This is uh from uh, Kyle, uh, but he's he's talking about um uh, when you uh what what is each of your personal experience around having little or no funds in the beginning of your startup and uh. And you need people with certain skill sets that you don't have. Like, uh, how do you get those people on board? Um, like writing smart contracts, uh, for example. Uh, not everyone has those skills, but uh, those developers cost a lot of money. How do you get people on board uh, to actually be a part of it and um, uh, possibly help build your product that you want? 
Yeah, um, from from my by experience, that was very easy actually, uh, because we I, I started the project <clears throat> as like a one week side project, as I keep mentioning, um, together with with a friend of mine called Fahim. He's a he's a designer, and he used to to work at the time, and I was still writing my bachelor thesis. So you know, I was living uh, I, I wasn't living at home, but I was living very cheaply and like getting my stuff paid, and really have a lot of expenses, and um, and then you know, it blew up and I, I thought, okay, let's, if we can make a thousand ADA, that's incredible. And uh, with N NFT maker version one, what it, what it was called, um, we didn't make a lot of money, but we saw that people liked it and we had a lot of unique customers, which was great. And then I said, okay, let's try to build this further and let's try to build, you know, NMaker studio and, and figure out um, what else to do. And we basically were able to, work on this part-time until we were able to pay ourselves fully and i at the beginning was living at home so like i had no expenses it was very easy for me and i'm a technical person so i was programming everything myself at the beginning and then i, I brought some people in like friends of mine and um, when we had money enough to to pay them first person we hired was actually customer support uh, his name is name is phil and um yeah and then you know i I don't know. It, it just happened. Like if you're bootstrapped, it's very easy. But I think most companies are not successful successful from day one like that. So it was a very lucky situation for us. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the same thing happened with us. We were bootstrapping. We actually tried to raise some, uh, I would say, pre-seed money with VCs and we spent maybe three months pitching to them and nobody cared. And we were asking $300,000 some, something like that. Already then we knew that we're going to do an ICO and that the cryptos are going to be uh, the big part of our ecosystem. Um, and then we just, I said, you know, let's let's cut those uh, conversations and let's just, you know, focus on ICO. And then how that went, you know, I was the main driver of the projects and then um, mm -hmm. on the project and I, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, find the CTO and uh, bring Brodiosipa because mm -hmm. uh, I knew those people and I believed in them and they believed in me. And then with time, you know, others joined uh, regarding the development. Uh, we didn't have any uh, 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 need for uh, some hardcore blockchain developers regarding the smart contracts and all those things because at that time when we launched the smart contracts are not were not even uh, uh, available on the cardano and actually we didn't know that we we're gonna launch on cardano so uh, uh, when i was uh, talking about and thinking about where to launch then uh, somehow i went to in croatia to a couple of those crypto events and then i saw that there are cardano meetups and then i figured out that a lot of people from region are actually working for ihk and I talked to those guys and they actually uh, uh, convinced me that I should launch on Cardano. And then we put everything on paper and I saw that, you know, there not, not much was at that time happening on Cardano. There was an op opportunity to be among the first projects launching them there. And also um, when we were thinking about launching, then we also talked with the Oconfy uh, about launching on a launch pad. But I said, you know, no, we should launch by ourselves so we build the token sale platform on our web page custom build first i believe it was the first on cardano so we were accepting only ada because also there was an option people told us ah you need to accept uh, debit cards credit cards bitcoins ethereums especially and i said no if if we're going to build on cardano we're going to just uh, um, accept ada and you know pe people just you know wanted to join it was a good uh, everything at that time was coming to its place it was all good until the ico and uh, then after <laughs> a different story <laughs> all right so but it was not fun. okay so in, in regards to actually raising the funds you did the ico patrick it seems like a, you had a okay or a good amount of revenue stream from the early days um, um from the platform which is uh, kind of key to get that all that cash flow in and now, Patrick, early on, you mentioned um, uh, when to cash out. And I know a lot of people have held on to their ADA since, you know, the, the major bull runs. 
um, and never cash out anything and, and, and thought, you know, it will keep on going up and up and up and up. But um, of course, now they have a lot less than what they did. How do you know when to cash out? Like, uh, and, and have you made that mistake yourself and uh, held on to all of your data? <laughs> Oh, I I did. (laughs) So, you know, personally and also with the company, I I was very lucky. I I bought ADA at, um, like myself, very cheaply when I I was uh, studying still. I I had an exchange semester in Singapore and I basically couldn't do anything because COVID was happening. So I was like locked into my room and all I did was watching, uh, watching Charles videos. And then I said, okay, I saved up all this money to be in Singapore and like spend it on traveling and looking around and so on. So I'm just going to put it all into ADA. And I bought ADA at like three cents or so. It wasn't like I became rich through that, but it was very uh, nice for a student, I would say. And, and I, I still have that ADA. So like, you know, Ada was at two dollar fifty. I could have made a lot more money. And um, with the company itself, like when we launched our token sale, like the reality is, uh, you know, like many projects, we lost millions by holding on to the funds. No, and, um, <laughs> yeah. and 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 also me personally, you know, like I could be. I could be a retired 24, 25 year old uh, living his life, <laughs> but I'm not, <laughs> and I I don't want to be. But but still, it would be would be nice. But yeah, yeah, these are the mistakes. So like my my new strategy is just cash out all the time, cash out you know every few days to just dollar cost average. Um, you're you're cashing out basically. And Vex, what about yourself? Since yeah, uh, you guys didn't yeah, ICO. Again, like I've- yeah, like I'm hearing the, myself. So, <laughs> and the funny thing is that I've been in this, you know, since 2017, and I said, you know, no, I'm not gonna make the same mistakes again. But somehow, I don't know. You know, we are all very gre- greedy, and greed is something that drives this industry. And when everything goes up, we all, I don't know, you know, we think that it's gonna go up forever. Um, but that's not obviously. Uh, uh, the case but uh, yeah we also raised at peak not actually at the peak but almost at peak because peak was in september uh because yeah uh, 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 before that a hard fork uh, uh so yeah <laughs> i don't know it's funny when you, you know our uh, people from the community i go in, to our telegram channel and i check uh, very often what people are saying and they tell me ah you don't care you you're rich you know and you have a lot of money and you took us <laughs> took our money i said come on man i don't i'm not rich i don't have money i'm actually very poor considering how much money i could have if i you know took some money you know and put uh, put it on side and you know and but when we are talking about the mistakes uh, uh, we we listed because we had to on centralized exchange uh one of the few pro, uh, pro, uh, projects that are uh, um uh, on success um in cardano we had to do that because we have to off ramp uh, our own token to to usdt and then to uh, to to fiat eventually to be able to top up those virtual debit cards which are our core feature and we did it we did that too early uh, we were forced by the community and we actually promised that and then we had to keep up the that that promise but we listed in the worst possible uh, time um on 7th of january that was actually the first day when when the bitcoin went below 40k and then from then on it was just you know bleeding 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 and people were selling our tokens and we didn't cash out anything on our own token you know uh, even the market maker asked ourselves you know guys do you want to allocate some funds to 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 sell it and i said okay let's do it let's put five million revo tokens aside and sell it if the price goes beyond one dollar and it never went you no know? so i was so over optimistic you know we thought that <laughs> it's gonna go all great and uh, people were actually selling and dumping on us because then uh, we ended up buying those tokens back from them uh, through our own liquidity uh, 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 which we provided uh, via our market makers. So, so many, you know, uh, uh, bad things and mistakes, but yeah, it is how it is. Uh, 
I've I've heard uh, from many projects uh, listing on a centralized exchange. Uh, you got to get that timing right and know when to actually exactly. do it. Right. And it costs a fortune to actually get that done as well. You paid one million dollar altogether for Gate and KuCoin. One million. One million. One, one, million. Okay. So one, one, more, one million and fifty thousand. Actually, it was Bitmart who was fifty thousand. <laughs> and then we said, you know, just delist us. Come on, because I was paying uh, additional money for market making and providing liquidity for Bitmart, and Bitmart is, you know, it's it's not good. Not a good uh, exchange, but yes, uh, one million all, all, altogether. Just KuCoin was seven hundred and seventy thousand. Uh, wow, crazy! Okay. Uh, it, now, now it's much cheaper, you know. And this is what what bothers me the most because now you you can get listed. You know, I'm receiving every day <laughs> those. Mm. Uh, yes, you know, if you want to be listed here and there, but come, no, no, it's not good timing. Uh, I, I think it's great you're saying these numbers out loud because these are <laughs> the numbers that that every project owner that has a token knows, but no one is talking about them in public. So like the community doesn't really know how freaking expensive this kind of stuff Crazy. is if you want to be be listed. And um, you know, and and also like the moment you open up a, a Telegram group with like any token, you start getting spammed every single day by. By you know listing officers from KuCoin and Max and like every every exchange out there, Bitmart as well, and um, and every time it's just you know absurd numbers, uh, especially in the bear in the bull market. So um, like that's the reason why why no projects are listed on any of the any of the centralized exchanges because none of the projects in Cardano have any kind of money. You know there are no VCs to pay yeah. that, um, and and if you have the kind of money like you really think multiple times about it um and yeah i i feel like but it's not just could... about the money uh, patrick it's it's also if you know if there if the money was an issue we we still would i would choose to stay longer just on the decks yeah because me too. it's a less liquid market when you are listed on kucoin it's like you open the gate to liquidity people can really buy token very easy and sell it as well and then if you are in a bear market you know you know so you're going to allow them to actually exit much easier out uh dexes are more complicated to use and you know people need to understand it and somehow you know it's more like a bubble market for itself and then you know those prices are more uh steady i would say uh and of course, yeah. you know, you don't have to provide liquidity by yourself. That's also a good thing. Uh, um, on KuCoin, you have some, you know, it's it's not just how much you pay for listing, but then you need to keep that spread uh, ac according to their uh, rules. You need to have um, daily um, trading volume at certain level because if not, they're going to delist you and you paid a lot. So, you know, then you're paying to market maker. I don't know if you are paying that on the DEXs, but I don't think so. Um, and market makers are, you know, um, think for themselves. Even the sexes, I will lost so much money with the KuCoin. They're like, everybody's trying to steal money from us. Uh, you know, they would just raise those taker and maker fees without uh, upfront notice. So, you know, we were paying at one time like 20,000 just for those fees um okay and so then you don't know what market maker is doing as well because you gave them access through the ap keys to you know to make uh, uh to fill up the order book so they can do whatever they want you know they can steal literally money from you uh wow. i always tell them guys you know make money to us don't lose our money you know we constantly need to provide more usdt you know mm -hmm. uh Okay, so don't don't use a very point. <laughs> yeah, so now it's real bad time to be on a centralized exchange. To to be honest, uh, don't don't rush with it. Okay. Now now That's that you a... have all these funds and you're and you're raising funds etc. and uh, you're cashing out the incorrect times, what what about um, uh, planning the projects? and delivering on what you're promising the community and what you're going to deliver on. I know we spoke about, um, you know, staying focused and making sure that we're uh, 
uh, working on what we're supposed to be working on. And Patrick, uh, you gave a good uh, um, uh, talk about that. But what about how do you plan your projects out to meet all these uh, various deliverables? That's the that's the big question. Um, you know, I I think focus is is the number one topic. Um, you need to be focused on on what you want to achieve. And I think like the one project that is getting this really right in the space right now is JPEG Store. Um, they are focused on building a, a good marketplace, and they just do that for collectibles. You know, they like Blake really understands what he should be focused on, and 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 I really admire that about them. Um, and you know there are other points where we might disagree but like that that part they get really right and for us you know we started as a minting tool but we always wanted to expand into other things as well so so i wanted to at the beginning uh, launch our own marketplace even before cnftio even existed and jpeg store and and we basically said okay how can we how can we achieve this we have to have our core developers on working on nmaker studio we need to hire people that are able to build you know a marketplace uh, we also want to have you know nmaker pay um, to make that checkout process more easy and we want to kind of have it all integrated so then it becomes really tricky because you have to find the right people that can you know um, do that for you and and if you want to hire quickly as i mentioned earlier that's actually a very difficult thing to do so so that's kind of the the problem we saw that we had um or i see in, in hindsight that we had too many different things happening and because of that i think we delivered on almost everything that we said but we had a lot of delays like many many delays and we also didn't do like the things that we should have done better um as good as we could have had done them uh, in, in, and instead we just did a lot of different things you know then projects like I don't know if you know Buja.io a project with like fractionalized art and real life art pieces from Andy Warhol and stuff like that that we did you know and a lot of focus goes there and then we do other things and and I think now we're really focused on just making Endmaker Studio the best that it can be and also focused on doing like the the white label stuff so we don't compete with jpeg store we don't compete with staking providers we don't pro compete with uh launch pads but instead we really focus on just building tools so that other people can you know sell nfts on their own website and that's the core um core offering of nmaker and we should have done that more in the beginning and then we would have been able to deliver more even even though you know i think we've been probably the most productive company in all of cardano in my opinion <laughs> without you know tooting my own horn too too much but like we oh, delivered sorry. on a lot of different things so yeah yep. I, I do have to agree, Patrick. Um, the, the stuff that you guys delivered in this first quarter, just looking back at that uh, massive Twitter thread that you guys put out um, the other week uh, for what you've delivered in the first quarter, it felt like that should have been delivered in a year. So, you know, uh, massive props to you Thank and your you. team there for delivering all that. So very, very, very cool. And um, I, I do have to say, looking back over the, the last two years, uh, I do feel like uh, the, the, the focus of the company has really sharpened recently. And that whole um, studio experience, like uh, with Zapier and all those really cool integrations in the white label marketplace, is very spot on now. So I, I, I like to uh, 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 highlight all those uh, aspects. Uh, and what about you, you there, Vex? Um, I know you, you said that you had the, um, uh, you know, the mobile decks that you guys were yeah. working on, and it didn't turn out too well. Uh, what, what about uh, your project planning and focus these days? Yeah, so uh, I have to agree ag again, you know, with everything that Patrick said, but it's difficult when you actually build that white paper and you have to, you know, explain people what you're going to build. And then you cannot actually put just one thing on that white paper. You need to put the roadmap, which is going to ref reflect on next three years what you're going to do. And it's really impossible to predict all the things that are going to develop, anticipate all the problems and everything. It's really impossible and that's why i said always that even the white paper and the roadmap which is really important part of the white paper it's it's subject to the changes because it has to you know if you know you need to adjust to to all new circumstances and everything but yes yeah, some things we really uh i know so for instance that decks you know i was uh, that was my 
one of the my my biggest mistakes because we tried to enter the DeFi alliance and then those guys told us you know no you're you're not DeFi you're not Cardano everything is you know more Web two more off off chain and then I said you know ah guys I'm gonna prove it to you that you know we can do the same things that you do and we actually hired the company in uh, in Serbia MVP um, uh, um, a company and uh, MVP workshop they built everything for Celsius which infamously went down <laughs> but uh, uh, we spent more than uh, maybe eight to ten months building that paying a lot of you know to build it and then yeah uh as you know always you know you think that you're gonna be uh done in six six months it was already eight months then nine months we weren't ready always something you know need to change and then you know it was already too late because i started to reach out to projects ask you know if they would be willing to provide li liquidity to our decks just to start with the five five tokens nobody wanted to give uh, uh um, their own token and ada we you know couldn't afford to actually uh, uh do it by ourselves and some other things as well and we lost focus uh so i would say the only good thing that we did uh, was the staking center because that was the incentivizing people to stay with us while we, while we are building the core feature but everything else was unnecessary and um yeah, but it's hard, you know, and people then, you know, you promise something and you always, in a way, under deliver because you're late, you're always late. And then they say you're a scam, you're, you know, you're <laughs> all the bad things and it's hard, but yeah, you just, you have to keep on working. That's why I like to see, for instance, an end maker, whenever I see, you know, uh, uh, Twitter channel, I always get <laughs> so many updates and news about, you know, what you guys do and really I see it, you know, you work, you work really hard and you have a serious product, uh, maybe the most complex one, I would say. Uh, and people usually don't understand how much of work is put behind that, even for our app, you know, it seems it's, it's I don't know, it's not so complex, but man, so many problems it, and everything. It's so yeah. complex. Yeah, people always yeah. underestimate that. And um, I, I can just echo you on that. It's really, um, it's crazy. Some And even sometimes the smallest things are like what take the most time. We built, sorry, Peter, to take like your, your uh, asking time here, but uh, just this, this last point. Uh, so we built this one thing which was supposed to be part of the marketplace which is NMaker Mint. And NMaker Mint is basically a minting tool built on top of the NMaker Studio API. So Studio is like the more complex layer and then NMaker Mint is on top. And NMaker Mint is like just an easy minting tool you can use if you don't have any experience without signing up, just upload an image and, and so on, and then you can release it. And, um, and it took us so long and it took so much focus because... We, we hired the wrong people for it. Then we built something. Then we scraped everything again. Then we built it again. And, and then we released it. And I, if I had to estimate how much it costs also just just with, uh, you know, the money we had to pay developers, it's probably like $60,000 or more, I would assume. Or yeah, probably a lot more actually. And, and we sold like maybe a thousand NFTs with that. So like a thousand NFTs were made with that, which is nothing in comparison. So it's like not, it's not profitable. It's not, no one knows about it. It's not even linked anymore on the main page. No one gave a shit when we released it. <laughs> um, so, and, and these are the things that really, <laughs> that re are really frustrating. So, yeah. Well, we yeah, learn from the mistakes, right? Yeah. yeah. We just, just the similar uh, story we said you know uh, there was an idea to uh, build in like the password sharing and swapping feature within the app and you know we spent three months building that uh, we thought that we're going to be done in two to three weeks so that was uh, three three months 100k and then maybe i don't know how how many but just few people use that feature and also, you know, when we were building it, that like the one team which which was building iOS took the different library than those who are who are building the Android, and then in the end they figure out that those two apps are not communicating well. So, 
total shitstorm for one feature that is super uh, was super unnecessary, <laughs> which nobody is now using. Maybe always they're gonna it. Yeah, <laughs> yep. it's yep. always like that. Yeah, if and I could and add a little bit, I, I think. Sorry, it's a. Um... It's actually a very interesting topic because I think many startup founders in our experience, as we have seen, always find themselves in the dilemma that you want to be very entrepreneurial, capturing all the business opportunities to uh, survive, to grow, and to uh, and also you're always in the process of finding product market fit to testing with the market and, and testing with new ideas, but, you know, versus really staying focused and delivering things. But if you're trying to be too much entrepreneurial or spend too much time, you know, fighting product market fit, and then you're going to be slow on deliver, you know, your main product or the first version of the thing that you have communicated with your community. So I think it's not really a, a mistake, but it's a, it's quite challenging problem for all the founders. And I guess the two of you all have the experience and you, um, um, at any, I'm sure you will have one, one point in your memory, like you, oh, this is really good. It's a really great business opportunity. We should do this or that's going to change or that's going to just open a new gate for our business. And that's really important. But then like you, over time, you found yourself trapped within many different things because some will work, some will not work. And uh, in the meantime, you start having community uh, or other people commenting, oh, what you're actually doing because we don't see this, we don't see that. And nobody realized, you know, all these different things you're trying to work out, you know, in the backstage, right? Absolutely. Yes, very much so. Now, we'll probably end this one on another uh, question that came from the community. And this one is, what is your top personal achievement thus far? And what is a future high-level achievement uh, that you are looking to accomplish in the next 6 to 12 months? <laughs> oh, we lost that. Max. <laughs> yeah. Your question just uh, scared away a guy. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, I thought his internet connection was getting a little flaky there. But uh, so this one's for you there, Patrick. Uh, what, what's your highlight uh, achievements uh, thus far? And uh, uh, what are you looking forward to in the next six months, six, 12 months? That's a really good question. Um, I. I, I don't think I have like a specific highlight where I would say, okay, this one thing is, is really amazing. I think it's just a culmination of everything. Um, like to me, the, the one thing that really stands out to me is when I think about how many people are in Cardano directly through Enmaker and through me and how many artists we, we um, you know, empowered and how many projects. I mean, those are like hard numbers that you can't, change they're just there and and i think they're really amazing uh, because you know we have like so many thousands and thousands of projects that just exist on cardano because of nmaker and we have like millions and millions of dollars which were paid out directly to projects and these projects only exist because they had the opportunity to launch through something like nmaker and um and and i think that's 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 really making me proud because you know, in the end, it, it doesn't matter what, what happens with NMaker long term, as long as like a few of these projects really build something amazing. And and there are like not a few, but there are tons of projects which are building something amazing. Like just look at what Book.io is doing and what, you know, Jesus 2 is doing. Uh, we brought over to, to Cardano and he's funding a, a movie, a short movie with, with his NFTs and stuff like that. And even even if he's not using NMaker anymore, I feel like the outreach that we that we have done to really just bring these people into the space is unparalleled, and um, and and it's like the closest thing we have to a commercial arm for Cardano. So I'm very proud of that, and um, and maybe the the other like, did you ask for a low light as well? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Throw it in. Okay, I, I I forgot what the question was. To be honest, I was just rambling along. But <laughs> uh, highlight achievements uh, that you have done, and then uh, in the future, uh, what you're looking. Oh, in the future. To. Okay, the future. Um, I don't I don't know about the future. To be honest, I I think like you know, Enmaker exists for two years, so the goal is to to be able to continue this for as long as possible and really build a, a solid long term company out of it. That's that's the goal, and um, yeah, 
and I don't know what what else to add to that. Okay, Vex. So what, what about yourself in regards to um, uh, some highlights that you you so had? We switched to positive things. <laughs> yes, yes. Let's end this on a positive. It was. I already thought this this is gonna sound very depressive. This video. <laughs> we are just talking about bad things. Yeah, true. <laughs> but I'm just looking at charts. Uh, Patrick, your token went down after you know because of this video. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> <laughs> we should stop talking about bad things. <laughs> well, <laughs> highlights. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so the biggest highlight for us is we really manage. I don't know how, but to onboard really a lot of people. Uh, now it's almost three hundred sixty thousand. More than 62,000 people created the non-custodial crypto wallet with us. Uh, around 2.9 thousand people are actively staking in our staking center. So those are good numbers, and you know we, uh, you know we brought people. But uh, what would satisfy me is actually you know to finally launch the core feature and allow people to pay and manage for those subscriptions. Use so you know those cool web3 features like you know uh, i can tell them you know come on guys don't you don't have to necessarily spend your own money on your netflix's spotify's and things like that you know you can invest in token stake it and use those staking re rewards to cover those rather small expenses which are 15 euros or dollars on average you know and then it could be win-win because you know you can profit on token on investing and then on you know not not spending your own money to cover those things uh you know even using nft technology we have a really cool cool use case uh in our ecosystem for that uh micro lending and borrowing is also a cool feature where, where other users can provide liquidity to uh those who don't have necessarily their own funds in the moment when something is due to pay and things like that so uh yeah if we if i can help people to save money and you know to live a better life that would be uh really awesome but now it's a matter of uh, delivering that you know to launch finally that uh, uh core feature out and you know see how that's gonna develop uh, that's you know <laughs> that's <Yep>. a highlight <laughs> <laughs> it definitely and is. Uh, also business wise the highlight would be you know uh, finally uh, to start um um Mm, you know uh getting some revenue because patrick this is really cool about you and your and your products so you started that from the from the beginning it's it's good and bad thing because it's a good thing that you at least you're know, getting so something you're bo uh, bootstrapping but then it's a bad thing when you are talking to vcs you are already out and you <laughs> they're looking for numbers and traction and i guess that the first question you get is you know uh what is your growth rate rate uh, and things like that so we can still sell <laughs> pitch our <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you know expectation on profits and on revenue uh, but this is something that i'm looking forward to uh, uh you know get you know to be earning some money uh in the end because up till now we were just spending 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 and that's uh it's exhausting <laughs> <laughs> that's that's interesting uh, uh, i'll just have a follow-up question on that so it, it's interesting that vcs are looking for projects that aren't making revenue <laughs> that's a good yeah i don't know if you watch that silicon valley show and when that guy told uh, the startup no revenue no revenue just no revenue they were raising money because <laughs> because when you're pre-revenue, you know, you can, you go there and you show your three-year projections and everything on revenue, you show them revenue streams. But when you're actually out, you know, it's a reality check. Then it, it opens whole new, uh, you know, set of questions. You know, what is your uh, uh, monthly grow, user grow, uh, you know, the revenue grow and things like that. And they want to see those numbers. And if you cannot... Uh, you know, satisfy their appetite, and I know it's hard because they are asking, you know, ten percent month over month, twenty percent, and things like that. Then it's hard to, you know, tell them that you have a really good business uh, uh, that you know can scale. And they say, you know, why you why you are not already scaling <laughs> uh, at you know decent pace? So yeah, that's interesting. 
And Patrick, <laughs> yeah, you're nodding yeah. a lot there, so I'm assuming you experience this it's as well. Like a, it's a typical experience because if you try to raise money with a crypto startup right now, you're not going to have a lot of growth because of the market conditions. Like none of the projects have a lot of growth. Um, like even, even the most successful Cardano project, JPEG Store, if you look at their volume, no. So, so like if the most successful Cardano project is not growing, uh, how are any other crypto projects, you know, supposed to show this nice growth curve that, that VCs want to see? So, so that's a big problem if you're talking to traditional VCs because they just say, okay, maybe it's not the right time to invest into a crypto startup right now. Um, and then you have to talk to crypto VCs who, you know, might invest and crypto VCs don't want to invest because they just lost a lot of money with the market conditions as well. And they have to in sometimes uh, save the companies that are already out there and that they already invested in. So so it's not a it's not a good situation and you really really are dependent on the market to be honest um if you're if you're a crypto startup yes exactly yes. exactly i think that's uh, i echo that that's very true we've been talking to a lot of investors and uh, uh, i think patrick is absolutely right so crypto vcs there they are actually market all of them are talk like even louder just pretending they're very active but actually many of them are getting capital calls everywhere like within their portfolio and uh, even with their lps so um it's quite difficult for many of them also and let alone for them to think about you know what they can do for new investments and um, and also you know when the market is not very positive and i think um, another fact is many of the crypto vcs if you look at them they're actually in existence for just maybe two or three years. Very different from traditional Web2 space where the VCs are operating for decades. They know how to analyze. They've been through cycles. But we have a lot of actually, I would say, amateur crypto VCs in the industry. And so they've seen the bull market, but now we're in the bear market and they're not sure what to do, what's going on. And they tend to follow the big guys. And that's an another phenomenon that we've seen with the current market with VCs. So I think the conclusion is like Patrick said, you know, unfortunately, we're very dependent on the market. And um, but if we can find a way to kind of bootstrap or manage to go through, continue to build, you know, before the next bull run comes and, um, you know, you're going to be very well positioned when the next bull run really started. Right. Very yeah. much so. That's, that, that's the plan. <laughs> Keep building in the, in the bear market. And to be ready when it matters. Yes, uh, exactly. Now, that's uh, pretty much all the time that we have for uh, this episode. We've just gone over the hour. So I'd just like to thank everyone here, uh, all the audience that has joined in on the live stream. Patrick, thank you for your time as well. Vex and Jason, thank you so much for uh, organizing and being a part of this uh, Crypto Talks episode two by uh, Genius Yield, Genius X. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pete. Now, if anyone you, wants to find out more information about uh, Genius X, you can get to the website at genius-x.co. If you're a startup, if you're building in the crypto space, they're chain agnostic now. So if you're building on any platform out there, you can tap it into the experience, such as what we've heard here from Patrick and Vex uh, from their advisory program and everything else around it. So check that out if you're building in the crypto space. But again, Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me in the episode. And again, thank you, audience, for joining in on the live stream. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you.